Good morning. Can you imagine what it would have been like to wake up on September 12th, 2001 in New York City? You leave your apartment, you're on your way to work, and you notice that there are not as many people out on the streets as there normally are. And you wonder, where are all the people? And then you notice that most of the businesses are closed. And you wonder, why are all these businesses closed? Then you notice that the trains are not running their normal routes. And you wonder what happened to the train schedule. Then you notice that the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, is not where it's supposed to be. And you ask someone, what happened to the World Trade Center? And that person turns to you and says, are you the only person in New York City who does not know what happened yesterday? And you ask, what happened yesterday? And they tell you about the terrorists. And they tell you about the planes. And they tell you about the towers coming down. This might have been what it was like to be in Jerusalem the day after Jesus was crucified. When Jesus was nailed on the cross, there were many things going on in the city of Jerusalem. For example, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, darkness covered the land for three hours. This darkness was unusual. This darkness was unnatural. And everyone in Jerusalem experienced the darkness. People were talking about this darkness, and many people associated this darkness with the crucifixion of Jesus. There was also an earthquake, and everyone in the city of Jerusalem felt this earthquake. It was a powerful earthquake. And many people thought this earthquake is a sign, it's telling us something. And they associated the earthquake with Jesus hanging on the cross. The earthquake was so powerful that many graves were opened up. And uh, many people were raised from the dead. And those who were raised up from the dead went into the city and they appeared to their family, they appeared to their friends. And so people were talking about resurrection. And many people associated this resurrection with Jesus dying on the cross. Everyone in Jerusalem was talking about what happened when Jesus died on the cross. In Luke chapter 24, this is the third day after Jesus died. In other words, this is the resurrection day. This is the very day in which Jesus was raised from the dead. There are two disciples and they're walking down the road and they're talking about the events that happened this weekend. Jesus, who has been raised from the dead, appeared to these two disciples. Now, these two disciples did not recognize Jesus as being Jesus. I don't know if Jesus just looked different than he did three days before. Or if maybe God blinded their eyes so that they could not see that they were actually talking to Jesus who had been raised from the dead. But they're having a conversation with Jesus. Jesus walks up to these, to these disciples and he asks them, what are you talking about? And the disciples say to Jesus, are you the only person in Jerusalem who does not know what happened this weekend? And Jesus asks, what happened this weekend? And so you have these two disciples who tell Jesus about Jesus. They say to Jesus that, that Jesus died on the cross. He was nailed on the cross. And they tell him about all the crazy things that were going on while Jesus was hanging on the cross. Now the Bible says in Luke 24 that these disciples were sad. Why were they sad? The answer to that question is given in Luke chapter 24, verse 21. Luke chapter 24, verse 21 says, We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. In my own words, what they said is, we trusted in Jesus. We believed in Jesus. We put our faith in Jesus. We put our confidence in Jesus. We put our hope in Jesus. We thought that Jesus was the Christ. We thought that Jesus was the Messiah. We thought that Jesus was the Savior. And yet Jesus died on the cross. And now we don't know what to believe. Now Jesus responded to that by saying to them that the prophets have, have told us over and over and over again that the Christ was going to die. You shouldn't be surprised by the fact that Jesus died 
if Jesus really is the Christ, because the prophets have told us that the Christ was going to die, that he was going to be buried, and that on the third day, he was going to be raised from the dead. Then the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The Bible says Jesus began with Moses. When it says beginning with Moses, I believe what that means is beginning with the books that were written by Moses. In other words, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So beginning with the books that were written by Moses, let's just say beginning with Genesis and going through the prophets from Genesis to Malachi, Jesus told them everything that the scripture said about himself. What an incredible lesson these two disciples received that day. Now imagine this. Imagine you had to teach someone about Jesus, but you could only use the Old Testament to teach them about Jesus. Where in the Old Testament would you turn? What passages of scripture would you use to teach someone about Jesus only using the Old Testament? Now, maybe you would think of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 is the very passage of scripture that the Ethiopian was reading in Acts chapter 8 when Philip meets him in his chariot. And the Bible says, beginning from that very passage, Philip preached Jesus to him. So Isaiah chapter 53 is an excellent passage to, to use to teach someone about the person and work of Jesus. Or maybe you would think of uh, the Exodus events and the Passover and how the Israelites uh, put the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts and they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. And of course we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and that through His blood uh, we have been redeemed and, and saved and rescued. And so going back to the Exodus and the Passover is an excellent illustration of the person and work of Jesus. But when I think about this, I wonder, what did Jesus say? Or what passages did Jesus go to in order to teach these disciples everything that the prophet said concerning himself? Did Jesus go to the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5? He could have, uh, because the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5 is an excellent uh, passage that teaches us about Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Now, this is a genealogy, and normally we are bored with the genealogies. We don't understand the purpose of the genealogies. It seems like some worthless information that we've got to weed through to get to the, the interesting things. And we think that the interesting things are the story that the Bible tells us uh, of events that happen. And so sometimes we even skip over the genealogies and just look for where does the story begin and let me read the story of the events that happen. However, this gene genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 is fascinating. We are going to find a lot of gems in this genealogy. And in fact, what we're going to see is the gospel has been prophesied through the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5 verse 1. Genesis chapter 5 verse 1. It says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Now, uh, Adam was the first human being that God created. What does the word Adam mean? The word Adam means mankind or man or human being. Uh, but we're talking about mankind. Adam is the first of his kind. Uh, he is man or mankind. Now take a look at Genesis chapter 5 verse 3. Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his own image, and he named him Seth. Adam has a son who is named Seth. What does the word Seth mean? 
The word set means appointed. Appointed. Now that's kind of an odd name to give a son. Who would name their son appointed? And or why would Adam name his son appointed? We'll take a look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Genesis chapter 4, verse 25 says, Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. Now think about this. Eve has just lost two sons, really, uh, because Cain killed Abel. Abel has been murdered, and Abel is not coming back. Cain, however, has been um, punished by being banished from the community. So Eve is not going to see Abel, and she's not going to see Cain anymore. She's actually lost two sons. But the idea here is, is about losing Abel. Uh, and so God blesses Eve with another son. His name is Seth. She names him Seth because she says uh, in verse chapter 4, verse 25, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel. So think about this for a minute. I know that if you have a child who dies, and then later in life you have another child, that new child is never going to take the place of the child who died. But there is this idea of Seth taking the place of Abel. Now consider this for a moment. Uh, let's not look at, at Abel and Seth as if they were two different people. But let's look at Abel and Seth as if they were one person. If we were to view it this way, uh, you have Abel who was a righteous man, Abel who was a just man, Abel who was a man who was living by faith, Abel who was a man who was pleasing to God, and he is murdered unjustly. A just man is being murdered. And you have Seth who is taking the place. Now you have this idea that one man is going to take the place of someone else. And I think in this, from a theological perspective, there is a glimpse of who Jesus is and what Jesus is going to do for us. Because Jesus is a righteous man, an innocent man, who suffers unjustly, and in doing so, he takes our place on the cross. He took our sins upon himself, and he took our place upon the cross. So I think there is a theological foreshadowing of Jesus in the person of Abel and Seth coming together. Now, let us continue, though, with this genealogy. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 6. Genesis chapter 5, verse 6 says, Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. What does the word Enosh mean? The word Enosh means mortal. Mortal. In other words, what it means is, you're going to die. And what a terrible name to give your child. Who would name their child, you're going to die? Mortal. It, every, every time he hears his name spoken, it's just a constant reminder of the fact that one day we're all going to die, that death is inevitable. When you think of the word mortal, it has the word mort in it. And the word mort is always something that refers to death. For example, you have a mortuary, you have a mortician, you have rigor mortis. And so the word mort is always referring to death. And so Enosh means mortal. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5 verse 9. Genesis chapter 5 verse 9 says, Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Kenan. What does the word Kenan mean? The word Kenan means inheritance. Inheritance. Now, this is a good name uh, to give your child. Inheritance. Because this name suggests that this child is going to have a good future. There is something that this child has to look forward to. This child is going to be blessed. This child is going to receive something valuable. Inheritance. So can you imagine Kenan asking his dad Enosh? By the way, the word Enosh means uh, mortal. You're going to die. 
Kenan, who's going to receive the inheritance, knows that his dad is eventually going to die, and then he's going to receive the inheritance. So I can imagine him asking his father, hey dad, when am I going to receive this inheritance that I've been named after? And I can imagine his dad saying, well son, you're going to have to wait 815 years in order to receive that inheritance, because that's how long Enosh lived uh, after his son Kenan was born. But take a look at Genesis chapter 5 verse 12. Genesis chapter 5 verse 12 says, Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. Mahalalel. That's a fun name to say, Mahalalel. It sounds very Middle Eastern, Mahalalel. What does the word Mahalalel mean? The word Mahalalel means praise you God. Praise you God or praise God. We have a word that's similar to Mahalalel that we use in, re, in a religious context today. It's the word hallelujah. The word hallelujah, which means praise God. Praises be to God. Mahalalel comes from the same word as hallelujah. And so it involves praising God. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 15. Genesis chapter 5, verse 15 says, Mahalalel lived 65 years and became the father of Jared. Interesting. We go from Mahalalel to Jared. Mahalalel sounds like a very Middle Eastern word, and Jared sounds like someone who came straight out of Arkansas. Actually, the word Jared here is probably pronounced something like Yared. Yared. And what does the word Yared or Jared mean? The word Jared means he descends. He descends, or he shall go down. He shall go down. Now, we have a phrase in English, which is, you're going down. In what context does someone say, you're going down? You know, when my son Cody wants to uh, wrestle me, he wants to get rough with me, I might look at him and I might say, Jared, you're going down. And uh, what I mean by that is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. You're going to lose. Can you imagine naming your son, you're going down? What hope does that son have of ever being victorious when his name is a constant reminder of or a constant message of being a loser? You're going down. But actually, he descends is not really the context of being a loser, uh, but rather coming down, actually coming down. So take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 18. Genesis chapter 5, verse 18. Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. What does the word Enoch mean? The word Enoch means dedicated or committed. Dedicated. Enoch was a man who was dedicated. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 says, Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. What does the word Methuselah mean? The word Methuselah means his death shall bring. His death shall bring. That's a very odd name to give your son. His death shall bring. Why would Enoch? Name his son Methuselah, which means his death shall bring. Well, take a look at Jude, verses 14 and 15. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Jude, verses 14 and 15. Jude is the book right before Revelation. When I say Jude, verses 14 and 15, because there is only one chapter in the book of Jude. But take a look at Jude, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch was a prophet of God, 
And Enoch was prophesying about the coming punishment that God is going to pour out upon what kind of men? Take a look at verse 15 and notice the word ungodly. The word ungodly is used four times in verse 15. Ungodly, 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 ungodly. What kind of people are these people? They are an ungodly people. And Enoch is saying that if you don't repent of your sins, there will come a day when God will punish those who are ungodly. And so he names his son Methuselah, which means his death shall bring. Methuselah was a living illustration of the coming wrath of God. In other words, um, Enoch knew that, that when Methuselah died, that Methuselah's death would mark the time when God was going to punish these ungodly people. So Methuselah's life is a marker of the coming judgment of God. In other words, as long as Methuselah is alive, these ungodly people have hope. They have an opportunity to repent of their sins and escape the wrath of God which is to come. But when Methuselah dies, then that door of opportunity is closed. They don't have any, any other opportunity to repent of their sins and escape the wrath to come because now the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon these ungodly people. Now, knowing that, there's something interesting about Methuselah. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. And what's interesting about Methuselah is that Methuselah is famous for one thing. Methuselah is famous for being the oldest man who has ever lived. Take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Methuselah lived for 969 years. Methuselah is the oldest human being who has ever lived in the history of the world. But Methuselah's life is a marker of the coming wrath of God. His death shall bring the wrath of God. What does this tell us about God? The fact that Methuselah lived for 969 years. What we see in, the, in Methuselah is the mercy of God. We see the heart of God. In other words, God must punish ungodly people, sinful people. But God doesn't want to punish these people. He wants them to repent of their sins. He wants them to, to be saved. He wants them to escape the wrath that is to come. And so God gives them opportunity. God gives them time in order to repent of his sins. How long does a man need in order to repent of his sins? You know, if God gives a man one year, is that long enough? If God gives a man 10 years to repent of his sins, is that long enough? What if God were to give a man 100 years to repent of his sins? What if God were to give a man 500 years to repent of his sins? What if God were to give a man nearly 1,000 years to repent of his sins? And if that man does not repent in, in nearly 1,000 years, then when God finally pours the wrath out upon that man, it's deserved. God is just in punishing that man. The man has had plenty of chances and plenty of opportunities to, to come to his senses, to repent of his sins and to make his life right with God. And he chose not to. And so God waits 969 years before his wrath is poured out upon these ungodly men. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The reason why the, the wrath of God is delayed in its coming is because God is giving men an opportunity to repent of their sins and escape the wrath of God. But take a look at Genesis chapter 5, 
verse 25. Genesis chapter 5, verse 25. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 25, Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. What does the word Lamech mean? The word Lamech means overthrown or conquered. Overthrown or conquered. Again, this is an odd name to give your child. It's not a good name. It's a message of being overthrown. His whole life is going to be a, a constant message of being overthrown or conquered. And then take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Genesis 5, verses 28 and 29, it says, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of his son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground, which the Lord has cursed. Noah. What does the word Noah mean? The word Noah means rest. The word Noah means rest. Now, an interesting connection here is that Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. So can you imagine Noah living with his grandfather, Methuselah. He loves his grandfather. He loves spending time with his grandfather. And then one day, Methuselah dies. And Noah is mourning. Noah is grieving the death of his grandfather. And Noah says, I wish I had more time with my grandpa, Methuselah. I only got to have him for 600 years. And, and 600 years just is not enough. I wish I had more time with my grandfather, Methuselah. Now, how do I know that Noah spent 600 years with his grandfather, Methuselah? Well, take a look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 26. Genesis chapter 5, verse 26 says, Then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech. So Methuselah uh, lives 782 years after after Lamech is born. So take a look at verse 28, Gen Genesis 5, verse 28. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son, verse 29, Noah. So when Lamech was 182 years old, he has a son named Noah, who is Methuselah's grandson. If you take 782 and subtract from it, 182, you get 600. So how long did Methuselah live after Noah was born? Methuselah lived for 600 years after his grandson Noah was born. Why is this important? Take a look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. The Bible says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. We're talking about the flood that comes in the day of Noah. This flood came when Noah was 600 years old. What that means is, the flood came in the very same year that Methuselah died. And Methuselah means, the word Methuselah means, his death shall bring. So when Enoch was prophesying about the wrath of God that was going to be poured out upon all of these ungodly men, and he named his son Methuselah, and Methuselah's life was a marker of the time when the wrath of God was going to be poured out. The wrath of God being poured out that we're talking about here specifically is the flood that happened in Noah's day. Methuselah did not die in the flood, but rather when Methuselah died, that was the sign that now God is going to send the flood to punish these ungodly people. Now, this is the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. How does the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5 teach us about the gospel of Jesus?
Consider this. Let's go back through these names. You have Adam. The word Adam means mankind. You have Seth. The word Seth means appointed. You have Enosh. The word Enosh means mortal. You have Kenan. The word Kenan means inheritance. You have Mahalalel. The word Mahalalel means praise God. You have Jared. The word Jared means he descends. You have Enoch. The word Enoch means dedicated. You have Methuselah. The word Methuselah means his death shall bring. You have Lamech. The word Lamech means overthrown. And you have Noah. The word Noah means rest. Do you see the gospel in the genealogy here? What it's saying is this. Mankind has been appointed a mortal inheritance. In other words, we're all going to die. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But it goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. Mankind has been appointed a mortal inheritance. But praise God, he descends. He comes down. He descends. And he is dedicated to the point of death. And his death shall bring, for those who have been overthrown by sin, rest. Jesus is the answer to our problem of sin. Jesus, who came down from heaven and who died in our place, providing for us rest from our burden of sin. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We need Jesus. Jesus is the answer to the problem of sin that is destroying the souls of people for eternity. But in Jesus, we can find rest. We can find comfort. In Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sins. In Jesus, we can be reconciled to God. In Jesus, we have the, the assurance of salvation. In Jesus, we have the assurance of eternal life. The invitation is, come to me. Come to Jesus, all who are weary and heavy laden, and Jesus will give you rest. Will you come to Jesus today? You come to Jesus when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, when you repent of your sins and you confess that He is the Lord of your life and you are baptized into Christ. You receive the forgiveness of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You clothe yourselves with the righteousness of Jesus. You participate with Jesus in His death, burial, and resurrection. And your name is written in heaven in the book of life. Won't you come to Jesus this morning and find eternal life that is only available in Him? May God bless you as you seek to, to do His will. Thank you.